All right, today's message is a little bit different than I normally do. I'm going to read tons of scripture, and it's going to be a lot of review, but you'll see kind of what I'm doing in a minute. Last time I preached, I preached on real hope. You guys remember that? It was, I think, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I, I, I preached on real hope, and, and the premise of it is what do you look at what you have? Do you look at it as a supply or do you look at it as a seed of what can be? Whatever your situation you're in, whatever you're facing, do you look at it as a seed you can plant in faith? Because that gives you real hope. Or do you look at it as your limited supply of your situation and what you have? Today's kind of part two of that, about how real hope creates real change. And as I said last time, I have real hope that Fulton is a city with a future. And I have real hope that this church is a church with a future. So real change is what we'll be talking about today, and real change comes from realizing how God sees us and how we see ourselves through that. That creates our identity, if you will. Our identity comes from God, and our identity impacts, affects, and directs. It impacts the way we see ourselves, it affects the way we walk, and it directs the way we interact with others. So today we're going to be talking about how we can have real change through realizing our identity, how you view yourself. So I want you guys to do a quick little activity if you're taking notes. You don't have to do it out loud, but I want you to write down how you view yourself, both good and bad, or you can make a mental note, how you view yourself. And then I want you to write down Things that people have said about you when you're a child growing up, things of that nature, because a lot of times that impacts and affects our identity and how we see ourselves. So write down some things that people have told you, good or bad, as a child, and write down how you see yourself. I'll just tell you a quick little story, and then we got a, a lot of scriptures. Like I said, it's going to be a lot of review, but I want to drive in how God sees us, because I believe that will change how we interact, how we act, and how we talk. But when I was in my second year of first grade, I started off a little slow. That was after two years of kindergarten. <laughs> True story, too. Um, <laughs> my second year of first grade, I was labeled severe ADHD. This is before they're labeling people with ADHD all the time. I know... I've done this before in other churches. I've seen other people do it, so it's nothing new, but I just wanted to show you a visual because a lot of times what people have said about us or what people say about us, it creates a label on us of how we see ourselves and interact. So I was labeled severe ADHD. I'm talking they put me on meds, and this was early 80s. I won't say how old I am. I'm only 28. Early 80s, but so it was before they handed out diagnoses like candy to everybody else. I was special. And then I was labeled same year, same day. Um, dyslexic. Put that on top of your ADHD. You're expecting a good time your second year in first grade. Um, and then I was, uh, I had a speech impediment to make it even better. I couldn't pronounce my THs. And I was put into a resource room in first grade. So when all my friends were having school, I got to go to a special room and learn how to say the and sutter, you know, things of that nature with my dyslexia and my ADHD, it was phenomenal. Um, I used to sweat when the teacher would ask you to read in front of the class because it happened all the time. And some reason, she, I think she always picked me because it was funny probably to her, not to me. But with the ADHD, the words are coming at you 100 miles per hour, plus I'm watching the squirrels outside because I'm attracted to movement. When I'm just moving and something's shiny, I'm, that's what I'm looking at. And then, plus with the dyslexia, so it's all backwards and jumbled together. And then with my THs and Ss, it was a fun time. First grade, second year, first grade, already labeled. And then I remember, it's amazing how you can remember certain stories, isn't it, of your childhood, but you don't remember anything else, but you can remember like one or two incidents. I remember I was down cellar in the basement my second year of first grade, and I won't say what parent, I was playing, and there was a parent down there with me, and I knocked over a thing of nails, and remember, I'm already in a resource room, I'm already failed four times, um, oh, twice, four, four times altogether in kindergarten and first grade, anywho. Um, and I remember this parent looks at me, I'm going to say a word that we're not allowed to use, but it was the word that was used, um, looked at me and said, are you retarded? 
I swear you're dumb. So, second year of first grade, now I'm labeled ADHD, dyslexic, dumb, they fall off. These things make up your image, how you see yourself, right? We all have similar stories of this. So then I realized what I was good at, at that age, I started fighting all the time. My second year in first grade, I got in a fight with an 18-year-old who broke my arm in four different spots. But I came home and my dad was so proud. He's like, men don't cry. Good job of standing up. Gave me a little bit of whiskey. Second year in first grade. And that day, he dubbed me the toughest kid in the neighborhood. Because I would fight anybody anytime. So that came my identity. It came my identity so much, that's kind of what I was known for, that's what I was good at, that's where I found attention at. So with my ADHD and everything else, I'm like, oh, as long as I can fight, I get attention. And I'm the toughest boy in the neighborhood. My dad calls me that all the time. That was my identity from my first year in first grade all the way up until I was about 28. But I remember seventh grade failed, went to summer school. Nine, or eighth grade failed, went to summer school. Ninth grade failed, went to summer school. 10th grade, failed, went to summer school. 11th grade, failed, went to summer school. 12th grade, my principal, some of you heard this story, but he didn't hear it all up behind, sits me down and says, guess what? We're going to push you through because you're, gonna, you're already 19, you're going to be 20 before the school year already starts, so you're kind of aged out. And by the way, you're worthless and I don't want you in my school. So that was my identity. Dumb, ADHD, dyslexic, worthless, and the toughest boy in the neighborhood. Loved fighting, got attention from it. That was my identity. That's how I carried myself. That's how I saw myself. I know a lot of us can relate to this, right? A lot of us have had labels growing up, and that's how we see ourselves, and that's our identity. And then I just want to share this with you, is eventually I learned to control my ADHD, I didn't have any help other than meds, but I don't even take meds any, anymore and counseling for years. Um, but I learned to control it on my own and turn it into kind of a superpower. And I learned to slow down so I can read better, if that makes sense. And then, so my second year in college, after my teacher said I was worthless and I should just work at a gas station, which is still honorable, but back then that was like a, ugh, you know. Um, I graduated with a 4.0, which is the highest you can get. You can't get higher than a 4.0 in college. Then I went to Oswego, graduated with a 3.8. Then went on to my master's, got a 3.7. Highest grades you can get. And then as you know, I became a TED Talk speaker, wrote five books, became an Amazon bestseller in three different categories, all because of this shift that I saw from God that changed my identity into who I really was. And it wasn't about how people saw me anymore. It was about how God saw me. And that's all of our identity. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's masterpiece. If you actually break it down in the Hebrew, it's a masterpiece. And what's masterpiece? A masterpiece is a creator's most pride possession of work. It's their best work they've ever done. So every one of you in here, no matter how you see yourself, how others see you, is a masterpiece created from the creator of the universe. That means you're not dumb, you're not this, you're not that. You are a masterpiece of God. And when you walk in faith with that identity, you affirm that you're a child of God. So that's what I want to do today is talk to us about our true identity. Like I said, it'll be a review for a lot of us, but a lot of us need review sometimes. Second Peter, he says it. Um, this is the word that I'm going to keep reminding you and reminding you of because repetition lets it sink in you. And I think we all need sometimes to learn about our identity and how God sees us. Because our identity impacts our self-worth and our confidence. It impacts how we carry ourselves, but when we align it to the way that God sees us, it creates a demonstration of God's grace and power through us. When we align ourselves with being a child of God, it boosts your self-worth and your confidence. It also, identity impacts your resilience and challenges. 
when you realize how God sees you, you become more resilient and you begin to face challenges through God differently than you do when you don't realize your identity. Your identity also impacts your relationships and how you interact. I can promise you, however you see yourself, however you wrote down you saw yourself, and what other people have said to you, impacts the way you connect and relate to other people, and it impacts the way you pursue Jesus, and it impacts the way you have faith in God. All comes from the way you see yourself. It's this powerful notion. The way you interact with God, the way you have faith for a situation, the way you interact with each other, the way you carry yourself, the way you speak, all comes from how you see yourself. And the problem is when we see ourselves a certain way, it hinders it. That's why we need to see ourselves how God sees us, because that's our true identity. So I'm going to give you, and then we're going to just dive into some verses. Some ways to live out your identity are this. One, know who you are in Christ. Cultivate a deep personal relationship with God through prayer and meditation. This allows you to continually seek him for guidance and strength. Number two, the second way to um, increase, to live out your identity is to cultivate relationships. Cultivating deep personal relationships with other Christians is life-changing. I say that once again. Because we all suffer identity crisis, if you will. We all suffer at times how we see ourselves. And when you are surrounded with other powerful, strong, anointed Christians, they can build you up and tell you how God sees you when you're having a bad day, when things aren't going good, when you need prayer. Those are the people that will come alongside you and say, don't forget, God says this about you. That is how you cultivate an identity in God. And number four, or are we on three? Three is my favorite. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. I'm going to say one more time. It's my favorite. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, imitate Jesus. Strive to copy the character and beliefs of Jesus. Consider how he would respond and talk in a situation. You can ask my wife. I'm not tooting my own horn, but she does it too. I try to live my life by this example where every time something comes up, especially if it's something I don't like, or especially if it's something I don't want to do, which happens about 995 times a day, I, you can ask my wife, I'm not tooting my own, I always say, after I get frustrated for a minute, how would Jesus respond to this situation? I say it actually out loud. My wife says it to me now too, every time I get a little, I don't want to have to go, how would, Je how would Jesus do it? So imitating Jesus. How would Jesus respond to this phone call? How would Jesus go do this wedding? How would Jesus go do that? And you imitate Jesus by the way you talk. How would Jesus speak to this person? Because that's your identity. So, number five, over on four. <laughs> Dyslexic and ADHD. <laughs> Where am I? Ser <laughs> serve others. Actively seek opportunities to serve others will help you understand your identity in Jesus. And number five, forgiveness. Forgive others as your Father has forgiven you. God has forgiven us, but we as people, especially this makes up our identity, like to hold on to grudges, bitterness, and anger. And God says, forgive, because those things hinder your spiritual growth. We talked about pursuing and thirsting more for Jesus. We won't pursue and thirst more for Jesus unless we start forgiving and imitating and walking like Jesus, realizing our identity in God. That will help us thirst and hunger for Jesus more. So when you walk in faith, you affirm your identity as a child of God. So now we're going to start just giving you some scriptures. As I said, this sermon is a little bit different than my normal go off on a tangent and just preach because I want to drill this into us on how God sees us because I believe that's how we will change in this world. Does that make sense? So I just want to drill in our identity. As I said, it's review for a lot of us, but we need to be 
reminded how God sees us because I know from just interacting with everyone in this world, not just this church, in this world, that a lot of us forget our identity and who God says we are because it comes out the way we talk, we act, and behave, and interact with each other, and how we look at our own selves and our own problems. So, real change comes from internalizing how God sees you. And I believe it's time for us to start living up to who Christ says we are, who God says we are. So the first thing God says we are in John 1.12, Romans 8.16, and Galatians 3.26, you don't have to write all those down, is this. Your identity is you're a child of God. As followers of God, you are adopted into his family and become his children. I know everyone in here has probably heard that a hundred times, but let it sink in for a minute. You are a child of God. That's your identity. You're his masterpiece. So I want you to say this. There's going to be a lot of repeating after me because I'm going to make this one way or another stick into our spirits today. I am God's child. God's child. Loved and cherished. Loved and cherished. Perfect. You don't have to say perfect. There's going to be more. I'll repeat after me, trust me. But when you believe this, when you truly believe you're a child of God, you walk different, you talk different, you interact with people different. And when you're not doing that, I'm not trying to condemn or anything, but when you're not doing that, it means you're more focused on your identity and how you see yourself other than how God sees you. So a lot of times we just need to shift our perspective on how God sees us. Number two, as Pastor Chris said a few weeks ago, you are redeemed. That's found in Ephesians 1.7 or Colossians 1.13. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, you are redeemed from sin and the power of darkness. Meaning, through Jesus, you have been restored, you have been forgiven, and given a new identity. Redemption, forgiveness, transforms your behavior. I'm going to say that one more time. When you realize you're not who you used to be and God sees you as a child of his and you're redeemed through him, that transforms your identity, your character, and the way you interact into a new creation. Number three, you are forgiven. Ephesians 4.32, your sins are forgiven through the grace of God. Church, you either believe that or you don't. You either walk around believing that your sins are forgiven by God or you don't. It's as simple as that. Jesus says, I have died and forgiven you. All you have to do is believe in me. There's nothing else you have to do. That should change the way you interact and talk and view yourself. Your identity is you're forgiven. I heard it once explained perfectly is... Um, all your past offenses and sins are thrown into a bottomless sea that can never be found again. Gone. So that should change the way you walk, interact, and talk. So say this with me. I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Embracing God's grace. Embracing God's grace. Number four, my, one of my personal favorites. You are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20. You are ambassadors of Jesus. Church, get this. This is your identity. This is who you are. If you believe in Jesus, you're an ambassador of God, which means you, Barry Lee, every time you walk into a room, you represent Jesus. That's your identity. Think about the way... Uh, I was trying not to preach today, but I'm, things are... But think about the way you interact and talked and behaved this week. I don't know. I wasn't with you all, so I don't know how you interact and talk this week. But if I was a betting man, and I used to be, I would bet a lot of us in here either complain, gossip, or said some negative things, right? I, I would bet at least one, one or two. Lucinda didn't, but everyone else, maybe one or two. <laughs> you are ambassadors of Jesus. That's your identity. Your identity is you represent Jesus every time you speak a word out of your mouth. Every time you go to a party. Every time you're driving a car. Every time you go bowling. Every time you go anywhere. Every time you go grocery shopping. You 
are an ambassador of Jesus. That's your identity. It's not defeated, hurt, sick, complaining, this, 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 and this. It's I represent Jesus everywhere I walk, everywhere I go, and everywhere I talk. Church, it's time to start acting like it. Start carrying yourself and acting like you are an ambassador of the creator of the universe. That's your identity. So say this with me. I am an ambassador, am an ambassador representing, Jesus representing Jesus everywhere I go. Number five, you are heirs. You are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus, Romans 8, 17, sharing in his inheritance of eternal life. Do you live like this? Do you act like it? Do you talk like it? Once again, being ambassadors, you're heirs. Do you live? Do you talk? Do you act like you're heirs to heaven? Think about it for a minute, because I know I don't at all times, but our identity, what happens is, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, what happens though is our old identity creeps up so often. That's why the Bible says that we need to die daily. You know, our old man keeps creeping up and your old identity is like, ah, here I am, the toughest boy in the neighborhood again. And God's saying, you're my child, you represent me everywhere you go. You're an heir of heaven. Every time you speak, you should be speaking life and hope into a situation. You bring my hope, my grace, my forgiveness. It's not ours, it's God's. And he's saying, you bring that with you everywhere you go. Every word that comes out of your mouth, you represent me. So you either believe that or you don't. You either believe who you are or you don't. You are salt and light, number six. Matthew 5, 13, you are called, and I wrote in here, scratch that, demanded to be salt and light to the world, not a source of darkness, not a source of hopelessness, not a source of bitterness, not a source of gossip, not a source of negativity, but salt and light, you bring flavor and illuminate through faith who Jesus is. You either believe this, or you don't. You either live like this, or you don't. Church, I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a church family that illuminates the hope and love and joy of Jesus everywhere they go. I don't care if there's three of us, five of us, or 600 of us. That part I don't care about. I just want a group of people who walk into a room and the atmosphere changes because of the hope that Jesus carries in them because of the light that Jesus carries in them. I want people who go out in the community and see the, I almost said H, double hockey sticks, the crap of this world and say, I represent Jesus. I bring the hope of Jesus with me. I speak life into situations. That's my identity. So, repeat after me on this one. Embrace, Embrace your, identity your identity in Jesus, for in his image, for his image. I shine. I told you, I'll make this stick somehow. Actually, the Holy Spirit will make it stick. I, I don't want I'm just an idiot. Number seven. <laughs> you are fruit bearers. Galatians 5.22 says, or gives us the fruits of the Spirit. So you are fruit bearers, meaning through the Holy Spirit, you produce fruits of the Spirit every place you go, which are joy, love, peace, kindness, to name a few. So think about your last week once again. This is your identity. Do you, every time you open your mouth, every time you speak, every time you, you interact with someone, bring hope, peace, joy, kindness? Do you produce the fruits of the Spirit? Or don't you? That's your identity. Number, are we at eight? Number eight, you are members of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. I love this one. Each of us are members of the body of Christ. This is our identity. We each have unique gifts and function, meaning when we um, gossip, complain, or what have you, we are hurting the body, but also when we don't show up to church, we're hurting the body. 
And like I said, this is not condemnation, but if you're a body of Christ, this is what, when I was meditating on it for a few days, what he was really downloading to me. If we are truly the body of Christ, like the Bible says, when we come together, we are one body. I mean, we have a mouthpiece, we have an ear, we have, I don't know other parts of the body, but there's some in there. Hands and pancreases and livers. Um, <laughs> who says livers? I don't know. I failed a lot. <laughs> Biology wasn't my thing. All right. We are all these things. We're one body. So let's say Dave is the foot. I don't know why. Yeah, because he kicks, kicks me in the butt. He, he does kick me a lot of times. <laughs> if he doesn't show up to church, if he's part of this real body, we're now missing a foot. But when we're all together, we're whole as one body. But also when Dave, I'm not saying you do, I'm just using this example now because you're right in front. I always use this example. Starts complaining or has this or that or just is not happy in life. You're now affecting the body too, right? It's like when you get a sickness in your body, it either um, needs to be healed, needs to be restored in the image, the identity of who God is, or it causes harm to your entire body. That's your identity. We are one body. Look around. <laughs> I was laughing at myself because I'm like, I don't know if I want to be a part of this body. Anywho, kidding. <laughs> I'm very sarcastic. <laughs> but look around. This is your family. This is your body. These are the parts of your body. And now I'm going to reverse that now because it's not your body. I just wanted you to get the picture. It's God's body. So this is God's body, it's his representation, it's his kingdom on earth, it's his son Jesus that we're supposed to glorify and shine. We together are supposed to be united together, shining as God's body. That's why we need every one of us to do our parts. We all have unique gifts. We won't, go, we won't do that too, I could keep going on that. Okay, number nine. You're overcomers. 1 John 5, 4. Through faith, you can overcome the world and its challenges. Do you act like an overcomer? Do you speak like an overcomer? When you talk about situations, when you talk about your money, when you talk about your health, when you talk about your family, do you talk like an overcomer? Your identity is you're an overcomer. I read the other day, which is just a powerful little statement, but it's extremely powerful, it's not little, but someone just posted a random thing and said, if Jesus overcame the grave, anything is, impo or anything is possible, and we can overcome anything. Amen. So we have faith in Jesus, who rose again, overcame the grave, meaning through Jesus, we can overcome any situation that life throws at us. And when we do, we're supposed to illuminate God, be his ambassador, walk as children of him. That is who we are. So say that with me. I am an overcomer. Am an overcomer. Conquering, life's challenges. Conquering life's challenges. Through Jesus. Through Jesus. I didn't have that part of my notes, but that's a very important part to add. Okay, number 10. You are vessels of God's glory, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. God's glory can shine through you as a vessel of his presence. Think about that for a minute. Everywhere you go, every situation you're in, your identity is not of so-and-so, not of your past failures, not of your hurts, not of what so-and-so has said about you, but your identity is a child of God, a vessel of his glory, meaning his glory should shine through you everywhere you go. That's your identity. Number 11, your instruments of righteousness. You're called to present yourself as instruments of righteousness to God. That's found in Romans 6.13. So I want you to say this with me. I am, I am an, instrument an instrument of righteousness, of righteousness. Tuned, tuned to God's will. Number 12, I got a bunch of these, but I'm going to speed up and cut them short because I also want to prove a point real fast or do something. Who knows what I want to do? Number 12, you are called to holiness. 
That's found in 1 Peter 1.15, meaning you're called to live holy lives set apart for God's purpose. So our lives should be holy through pursuing Jesus. Holy means set apart, different, unique in God. God is holy. He is righteous. We are called to be that. Real change glorifies God. So I want to ask yourself this, because holiness gives your life a purpose, and your purpose is to um, glorify God wherever you go. So I just want you to ponder your last week's conversations, your last week partying, your last week's um, driving your car, your last week, whatever it is, did it glorify God? Because your identity is one that glorifies God, not yourself. Church, if we can get this right, we can change situations and circumstances. Um, I'm just looking real fast because I'm going to speed up, so I'm not going to read them all off of what you are. But you're God's chosen people. We'll do this one. We are made in God's image, right? Genesis says this, we're made in God's image. So that's our identity. Our identity is we are made in his image, which means, I've said this before, but get it in you, because this is our identity, who we are, how we carry ourselves. Every single person in here is also made in God's image. So think of someone you don't like. It doesn't have to be in here. I'm thinking of Chris. It was a joke. He prayed for me after, before service, and I felt the Holy Spirit just go off. So I was going to say, Chris, you're praying for me every time I preach, so get used to that. Um, <laughs> all right, so think of somebody you don't really like or might irritate you. They are also made in God's image. That's their identity. Your identity is you're made in God's image. Think about this. We're the only thing in all of creation that God said he made in his image that he actually thought about and started forming and making. We're his masterpiece, greatest work. But that means now, when I start saying how bad Barry Lee is and how I can't stand Barry Lee, I'm really speaking against God. I'm speaking against his image. I'm speaking against something he created. <laughs> Let that sit in for a minute, because that messed with me this week when I was thinking of it that way. If Barry Lee is truly made in the image of God, and I don't like Barry Lee very much, it means I don't like something God created. His masterpiece, I'm saying, eh, didn't do that good of a job on that. It's true. Made in his image. I made in his image. His identity is just like my identity. So what happens is a lot of times, that's for you ADHD, you have that too. That, <laughs> a lot of times what happens is we want Barry Lee to love me the way that I am loving Barry Lee. And when Barry Lee's not loving me the way I should think he should love me, I start getting upset at him. I start bumping heads to something that God created, his image, his perfectness, his creation. Because through Jesus, Barry is made whole, complete, and perfect in God's eyes. And I'm saying, uh, but you're not loving me the way I'm supposed to. And God never says that. God says, love my people as I love them. doesn't matter how they love you back. You're supposed to love my people. You represent me. You can't control how they love you, but love my people the way you love, or I love them. That's your identity. When you walk into a room, when you talk, when you confess, when you speak, you're speaking life. You're speaking wholeness. You're speaking about God's perfect creation. Think about this. If we could just switch this just a little bit, if we could just change how we see things in our identity and how God sees every single one of us as his, it would change the way we speak, it would change the way we interact, it would change the way we carry ourselves, it would change our faith, it would change the way we pursue God, because we'd realize every single one of us is a work in progress, yes, but we're, some of us more than others, but <laughs> we are made perfect and whole and righteous in God. And that's your identity. It's not ADHD. It's not dumb. It's not this. It's not that. Those are labels that people have put on you throughout your life. But God says, you are my child. You're my ambassador. You represent me wherever you go. I formed you and created you. I knew about you before you were even born. I spoke 
you into existence. I breathed into your lungs for this particular time in this particular place because I believe you guys are my change. That's what God was saying. God's saying, I purposely put my people here at this particular time when all this crap is happening in the world because I know you guys can create change. You're my body. You're my image. You're my reflection. But a lot of us can't even hang out or sit in the same room or talk about someone. It doesn't have to be in this church family, wherever it is, it's this society now, without complaining, without thinking this or that. And God's saying, that's not going to change the world. That's not going to bring my faith. That's not going to bring revelation. That's not going to bring people to me. You're called to be different, set apart, and holy. You're called to speak and talk like I created you in your identity. So when this happens... Our voices, the way we speak, starts to change. When we see how God sees us, and when I realize God created Chris, and Chris is in God's image, and God created Eric, and Eric's in God's image, and I'm created in God, in God's image, it changes the way we speak. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, The tongue has the power of life and death, those who eat from its fruit. When you have an identity in God, your voice should change. The way you talk should change. When you have your own identity, it won't change. And if you want to experience Jesus more, I'm not saying it's a works thing, I'm not saying this or that, but I'm saying we need to realize how we see ourselves or we're going to get caught up in our own life, in our own circumstances all the time, just bumping heads with our own problems and nothing's going to change and the way we speak won't change. Luke 6, 45 says this, a good man brings good things out of good stored up in their heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart for out of the mouth speaks the heart, what it's full of. Think of how you speak. That shows me, shows yourself, how you see yourself. You either see yourself how God sees you, or you see yourself how others see you. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that it's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Church, I want to church people who talk life into each other who build each other up, who speak about hope. A fee, or Proverbs 13, 3 says this, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruins. First Peter 3, 9 says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Woo, that's a good one. <laughs> but on the contrary, repay evil with blessings because this is what you're called to do so you may inherit the blessing. How many of us, I won't go too off on a tangent because i got to land this thing, but how many of us, the minute someone says something negative about us, we repay that right away to somebody else or them, right? We hear something like, oh, yeah, but Chris, <laughs> I saw him doing keg stands at a frat party yesterday. I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> Instead, the Bible says we're accountable for everything we speak. And we'll have to answer for that one day. I'll show you that scripture in a second. But we should speak. He says something negative about me. I should now speak life into him. That's what makes us different as Christians. When someone says something negative, when somebody says something's not right, when somebody says this is not that, you can look at the truth, but it's also now repaying it with building something up. Chris may say, hey, you're dumb. And I'd say, Chris, you're loved by Jesus. Look how that changes the situation. If someone's angry at you and says... And then you repay it with what God says about them, it changes an entire situation. That's why the Bible says we need to speak life, speak and build people up. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they speak. Build others up, don't tear them down because our words matter. Speak life ignites positivity. You carry hope in your words. So, as I wrap up, when you speak negatively, when you tear people down, when you're angry, you're seeing yourself in your own identity. Our identity isn't how God sees us. 
That's why I had you repeat a bunch of things. Because I want to, in your spirit, who you are in God. And when you realize that's your identity, your vocabulary will start to change. When you realize you represent Jesus everywhere you go, I so hope the way you speak changes. If it doesn't, really let that meditate with you for a minute. Because your identity is you're his ambassador, you're his child, you're his representative of his son, Jesus. So every word you speak should represent that. Every place you go should represent that. Your identity is in God, is not in our problems, is not in our situations, is not in other people. And the sooner we can understand that and change, our vocabulary will start to change, and we'll become a church and a community and family members of people who look at each other and call out positives and builds each other's up and just speaks life into situations. As I get a bit to pray, I kind of threw three words together there. As I begin to pray, I want you to really just think of this. Look around one last time. These are your family members. Not that Chris. <laughs> Everyone else except that Chris is your family members. You're a part of one body. You're created in God's image. So when you speak to each other, when you interact with each other, speak and interact and build life and hope into them as you would speaking to God. Not saying we're gods. I'm saying if we're made in his image, when we talk to each other, we should talk also how we would talk to the creator of the universe because we represent him. We should speak life, hope, love, forgiveness into each other's lives. We do that, and this community will change. Your life will change. You'll start to hunger and thirst for God more. You'll notice a difference, I promise you. So if you guys will bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you so much for the word of God today. I thank you for worship. I thank you for every single person in here. I thank you for what you're doing in this body. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I ask that your identity takes root in us. That we start seeing ourselves the way you see us. Not the way other people have spoken to our lives in the past, but how you have spoken in our lives. Let that change the way we speak about and to each other. Father, continue to grow us, continue to show us, continue to mold us, continue to work on us, continue to agitate the things that you want us to change and continue to point us and give us grace and love on the things you want us to grow. And Father, please, ha, please just take root in every one of our spirits, myself included, so we can be more like your son Jesus everywhere we go, that we can walk in his forgiveness and his love and grace. As for these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Downstairs to your left, there's a fellowship hall with tons of goodies and coffee. We'll see you guys down there, and then we'll have our small group as well. Have a great week. And, oh, Lori back there, hi, Lori, has the, um, um, the basket for tithe offering, connect cards and things like that. Put those in the basket. Have a great week, guys.